Let's talk about the inner ear. Just to kind of get us oriented, let me start with where everything's at. So I went ahead and drew the stapes or the stapes. I'm not exactly sure which way which pronunciation is correct, but I've heard it both ways. But anyhow, the stapes is part of the middle ear, and you go back through the bony structures of the incus and the malleus, and then you get to the eardrum. So that would be middle ear up to right here, which is the oval window. Down here I've added the round window, but we'll talk about that in a minute. But sound, or the vibrations can enter through the stapes uh, force on the oval window. And then sound initially will be essentially just travel into the cochlea. Uh, so this whole structure right here would be the cochlea, and then all of the red and blue loops would be the vestibular system. Now to knock out a little bit of terminology, we have these two red structures right here. These are called the utricle and the saccule. And then, so we get utricle, saccule, then we have these loops. So we have this superior loop, we have this posterior loop, and we have this horizontal or lateral loop. These are semicircular canals. Now what I'd like you to do is imagine that all of the white is bony structure. All of this surrounding everything is bony structure. Uh, so the, the bony structure, the canals in the bony structure, we're going to call the bony labyrinth. And inside of the bony labyrinth we have these membrane structures and within the, the membrane structures and the membranes themselves we call the membranous labyrinth. That also goes for the cochlea. The main tube is all a bony hollow tube and then this blue is a blue membranous tube that's inside of the larger bony hollow tube. The bony area contains uh, a fluid called perilymph. Perilymph is... I couldn't really find a source to say exactly what made the perilymph. Um, I didn't look extremely hard, but I did look in three different sources. Uh, but it, it communicates, or it has a communication with the cerebrospinal fluid. It doesn't say that it is cerebrospinal fluid. It doesn't say that it comes from cerebrospinal fluid. It just says that it has uh, a communication, a, a canal that it goes through, that it, it communicates with CSF. And it also says that its ionic properties are almost identical to CSF. But it doesn't, there was no source that I found that says that it was the same thing as CSF. So we have perilymph and we have endolymph. Now the endolymph is completely different than the perilymph as far as its ionic profile. In fact, it is extremely high in potassium. It actually has a higher potassium content than the inside of the cells of the membranous labyrinth. Now the, the next thing I want to point out is in these semicircular canals, at the ends of them there are these outpouchings. These outpouchings are called ampulla. These ampulla actually contain the cells that are going to detect the movement of endolymph through the semicircular canals and be able to turn that into an electrical signal that says, I am accelerating in a circle in this specific direction. So the ampulla is what contains the cells that make the, the nerve signals. So when we're talking about semicircular canals, we're specifically talking about angular acceleration and when we're talking about the utricle and the saccule we'll ta we're talking about linear acceleration the utricle and saccule also have cells that detect that movement now let's talk about exactly how that works so imagine here that I tilt my head to the side as I do that the fluid inside of the superior semicircular canal and this horizontal semicircular canal are not going to move however when I tilt my head to, when I tilt my head this way, the fluid inside of this posterior semicircular canal is actually, so I tilt my head downward, but the fluid has a slight inertia, so it's going to move relatively in this direction. And so it's going to have this kind of movement at first. And so well, the reason I say at first is because it only detects acceleration. As soon as the fluid uh, catches up with the body, it, you could keep spinning all day long, you keep spinning all day long as long as your the rotational velocity doesn't ex doesn't change, the rotational acceleration doesn't change, then the fluid your your body will detect no change in the f movement of this fluid. You'll become at equilibrium. However, as long as you are changing the acceleration that you're spinning, I spin this way, the fluid the the endolymph is going to have a relative movement in the opposite direction. 
And so as it moves in the opposite direction, let's line this all back up, it's going to interact with the cells inside of the ampulla. Now what about the utricle and the saccule? Well, the utricle is going to have uh, cells that detect horizontal movement. So you can go forward or you can go backwards and that's going to be detected by the utricle. On the other hand, the saccule is going to detect upward and downward acceleration. Now you might remember from physics class that gravity and acceleration are indistinguishable from each other. So the saccule is actually very important in detecting the gravitational field and keeping you in, in balance in that particular way, where the utricle is very important for uh, detecting forward and backwards acceleration, not movement. Once you get to uh, an, a constant velocity, the utricle has, uh, has no ability to detect that. But as long as you're accelerating, you're speeding up or slowing down, the utricle sends a message to your brain to tell it that. The saccule is also one of the things that uh, cause a little bit of um, confusion when you're on an elevator, that slight confusion because it's sending a message to your brain, but your brain's also getting messages from your eyes, and your eyes see no difference. And so you kind of get a funny feeling when you start going up or down on the elevator. Let's talk about one more thing that's really cool about these semicircular canals. So imagine that you are spinning, your head is, you're spinning around this direction. So you're spinning this way. Uh, you're just spinning in a circle. So you're spinning this way. The endolymph is actually, because of its inertia, it, it's relatively moving in this direction. And then eventually it catches up to the speed of your head and it feels like it stops, but it's really moving in this direction with you. Um, and then as soon as you stop, sudden stop, that, that fluid is still movement because of its inertia. And so until it slows down and comes to a complete stop, it continues to interact with your ampulla after you stop. And so it gives you the feeling that the world is spinning unless you slow down, you spin and slow down at a, a slow rate, allowing it to slow down with you. In just a minute, I'm going to talk about exactly how the ampulla works, but first I want to give you a little bit of uh, a way to remember in what direction of movement each of these are detecting uh, acceleration. So the thing to remember is that we have semicircular canals in both ears. In order to remember exactly which one's doing what, we're going to use our hands. So we have lateral semicircular canals, so let's just take your elbows and move them laterally. Let your fists touch. As long as you're moving in the yes no or the no, shaking your head no direction, you're stimulating the lateral semicircular canal. So your elbows are lateral. Then you have the superior. So take your fists and place them superior on top of your head. As long as your head is moving in the same vector as your arms, you're stimulating the superior semicircular canals. And finally, there's the posterior. So you take your fists and put them behind your head. As long as you're moving in the vector that your arms are placed in, then you're st stimulating the posterior semicircular canals. So that's basically it. As long as you're shaking your head in like a yes direction, then you're stimulating the superior semicircular canals. If you're shaking your head no, you're stimulating the lateral or the horizontal. And if you're shaking, if you're moving your head side to side, then you're stimulating the posterior semicircular canals. So let me explain a little bit how this works. Imagine that we have a, a, a canal here. So we have the semicircular canal and then we have this ampulla, this swelling in the middle of the semicircular canal. So we're going to have a base of cells right here and under that base of cells we're going to have the nerve fibers connecting to the cells and the nerve fibers will travel out from there to go to their uh, the, the cell body. So so the cell body being away from the nerve and it has other projections out so it's a bipolar cell. Now zoom in a little bit and look at the, the cells. On these cells you're going to have uh, hairs and these hairs are kind of arranged like this. So they, they start off small and go big. The largest one is known as the kinocelium. So I'll write that out, kinocelium. So these hair cells are actually attached to a, gel a gelatinous membrane known as the copula. So here we have a gelatinous membrane attaching, and, and you got to imagine that there's going to be hair cells on all of these as well. The smaller hair cells are going to be stereocilia, while the longer one is an actual true cilia. 
Now let me just actually redraw the the, cop the cupola. It's it actually is going to reach the top of this uh, of the ampulla, and so as fluid is moving either this way or this way, this uh, cupola is going to act as sort of a sail or a kite. And so here we have our kite, it's attached to a string, and our fluid movement would be the wind. And so as the wind hits this uh, cupola, it causes the cupola to pull on these strings or hair cells and move them in one direction or the other. So now let's look at the hair cells themselves. So the hair cells, they have uh, channels on them for potassium. And the, the potassium in the endolymph is higher than the potassium in the cell. And so as they get bent uh, away from the kinocelium, the potassium channels close. As they get bent towards the kinocelium, the potassium channels will open and potassium will influx into the cell. So the potassium channels are always slightly open. There's always some influx of potassium, very small. And, and whenever they get bent toward the kinocelium, potassium enters and it causes depolarization. Why? Because you got positive charge entering into the cell and so it causes depolarization. This is different from most other cells that have uh, sodium moving in. In this case, potassium moves in at the top. At the bottom of the cell, which is not drawn here, the potassium will actually move out. And so that's how repolarization occurs. Now let's think of each ear uh, together. So if I have my horizontal semicircular canal of my of one ear and the horizontal semicircular canal of the other and I have the ampulla here and I have the ampulla here as as fluid is moving this way through this ear causing the the cells to uh, close their potassium channels it's moving this way in this ear causing the cells to open their potassium channels and so your brain can use the relative uh, signal strength from each side to determine which way the head is moving. Now I want to say as a disclaimer I am not sure how it works for the superior semicircular canals because as far as I know and I could not find for sure I think that the that both sides have their ampullas on the front of the uh, 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 towards the face towards the the ventral side so I don't know that for sure but that's what I think and so I'm not sure exactly how those work in conjunction with each other. Now let's talk about the utricle and the saccule. They basically have the same structure. So I have my the floor of each organ, and then I have some uh, otolithic, uh, or I have some hair cells that come up, and they're all implanted in a gelatinous gel. So they're inside it. So you have this gelatinous gel that forms over them, and inside of that gelatinous gel, I have uh, these calcified, uh, these ca uh, calcium carbonate uh, rocks, these crystals, they're uh, usually microscopic in most species, however in some species of aquatic animals they can get quite large and they can actually be used to age the species. However in humans all my sources say that they are microscopic. Now what's the purpose of these? The purpose of these crystals is to add, to add inertia, to add mass by adding mass, it increases the inertia of the of this otolithic membrane, this gelatinous membrane that is surrounding these cells. So let's just imagine for a second that you are accelerating in this direction, and then we're going to have our our hair cells because they're inside of this membrane. They're going to be uh, the the inertia is going to pull them back until the acceleration becomes uh, zero, the velocity becomes constant, and then as you stop. As you stop, they're going to be uh, accelerated slightly to, to the other direction because the otolithic membrane has the inertia to keep going. And this movement again opens potassium channels or closes potassium channels completely. I think the main thing to remember clinically is that the utricle, the utricle is horizontal movement and the saccule it is going to be up and down. So think saccule, think I sat down. So now the last thing we have to talk about is the cochlea. And so in the cochlea it looks like a snail. And I say snail because everything is snaila or I would call it scala. So all of the structures in the cochlea are going to have the prefix scala because it looks like a snaila. 
So what happens, you get the vibration right here from the stapes or stapes, again I've heard it both ways, and then the vibration comes down through this superior part. So this is, this is blocked off right here, the only way it can come in is through the superior part, and the superior part is near the vestibular system, so this is called the scala vestibuli. And so in through the scale of vestibuli, which comes around, we're going to follow it. We're going to try to follow it all the way down. And so it comes in. It's still going around. It's going around. And then it comes back. And it, right here where it gets to this, this peak area, this peak area called the helicotrema, it circles back around. Now it's on the inferior part. And this inferior part is called the scale of vestibuli. And so it comes back through the scale of vestibuli, and it comes out this side and then it communicates with the round window where it releases, uh, I'm sorry, this is called the scala tympani, and it communicates with this round window where the, the pressure is kind of relieved or released. And this round window is near the tympanic membrane, so this is the scala tympani. So we have scala uh, vestibuli, scala tympani, and then this uh, middle part, it, it does not have any connection to the outer part at all, it doesn't have any communication to it any, is, is anyhow. So in this middle part, sometimes it's called the cochlear duct, and other, other uh, sources will call it the scala media. So again, we have this, this outer layer, which is all going to be bony area. Uh, this, right inside of it, we have perilymph, but then inside of the uh, scala media, inside of the cochlear duct, we have endolymph. Now it's easy to see from this picture that this thing goes around in a circle, but what is not easy to see, if we go ahead and draw this another way, so let's say that that's the, that's the tip and it kind of comes around and it keeps coming around and it, it kind of makes a, a, an upward cone shape. Um, and, and I don't know if you can tell from this, so, so right here we would have the, the tip of the cone and out here we would have the base of the cone. And let's imagine that we take a saw uh, and we cut straight through right here. What would we see? So what we would see is we would see this uh, bony center that's kind of uh, triangular shaped. And on the outside we would see a bunch of these uh, canals. And so inside of these canals, what do we have? So in, inside of them, I'm going to zoom in and we'll just look at one. Inside of these canals we have three chambers. So in the top chamber, this would be the scala, scala vestibuli. This would be the scala tympani. And then in the center, we would have the scala media or the cochlear duct. Now as we zoom in even further, what we'll see is that inside of this, we have, we have basically uh, four rows of cells. So I have a, a, a group of three cells uh, sort of uh, lateral and then medial towards the center of the this triangular bone we have another single row of cells and so there's many of these going all the way out and so there's many of these they go all the way out each of these makes a row of cells so we have these three lateral rows that are close together and then a little bit further away we have a single uh, row of cells and you can just imagine that these rows of cells are traveling all the way through the cochlea uh, in this pattern. So let's take a look at what we have. We have this single row and we have these three lateral rows and then on each of these we have hair cells. And then projecting out from, from the, uh, uh, from the medial area we have this membrane that covers and connects to all of the hair cells. And so zooming out just a little bit, we see that this membrane, it starts medially and it works its way up and then it just stops right there. And so down here on this part, this is called the basilar membrane. The basilar membrane communicates with the scala tympani. And these cells are attached to the basilar membrane. So as sound goes through the scala vestibuli, we don't, get any, we don't get any stimulation of these cells, but as it travels back through, remember it, it communicates around at the apex, and then it travels back through. As it's traveling through the scala tamponi, we get vibration of this basilar membrane. So again, we have this basilar membrane. We have this other membrane that goes over the top. This one is called a tectorial membrane. 
And so it's tectorial. You can remember that because the, it comes from the Greek word tegos. Tegos, it's tau, uh, epsilon, gamma, omicron, sigma. And so tegos means roof or ceiling. And then in the Latin, that gets changed to tectum, which means covering. And so this is a roof, ceiling, or covering over these hair cells. And this uh, roof, it functions because while the basilar membrane is uh, moving uh, very easily, this is a little bit stiffer, and so there's going to be relative movement of the hair cells with respect to the basilar membrane and the tectorial membrane, and that's going to either open or close potassium channels, causing uh, either depolarization or hyperpolarization of the hair cells. And then the nerve, we'll make the nerve in red, the nerve that innervates each of these is going to travel into the bony structure in the center and travel out through the cochlear uh, portion of the vestibular cochlear nerve. Now just a few more things I want to uh, make clear is the, just the naming of, of all of this. And so um, first of all the these outer hair cells, these are called outer hair cells, this is called inner hair cells. Then the bony structure in the middle is called the modiolus of the cochlea. There's uh, multiple modioluses in the body, one's in the mouth, one's in the ear. This is the modiolus of the cochlea. And so I've labeled these uh, modiolus right here, outer hair cell, inner hair cell. And lastly, because this is the scale of vestibuli, this is the vestibular membrane. Now before I talk about any neural pathways, I want to I uh, point out another function, is that the ear is tonotopic. That means that uh, the frequency and the uh, the frequency of sound that can be heard along each portion of the cochlea is going to be different. So here at the uh, proximal to the the uh, oval window, the frequency is high pitch that can be heard, and then proximal to the helicotrema, uh, only low pitch sound can be heard. So as we follow the sound through it's going to get to the helicotrema and then at that moment low pitch sound begins to be heard and then higher and higher pitched sounds begin to be heard as we get out back towards the round window. And the reason for this is, is twofold. The first thing is we have something called resonant frequency from, if you remember that from physics, uh, resonant frequency says that uh, each type of material and the thickness of the material will determine at what frequency it vibrates the best. And so the thickness of the basilar membrane and the, and the tightness of it changes as we go out and so the basilar membrane is going to have a different resonant frequency. The other, thi the other thing that makes uh, sound tonotopic is the, uh, the nerves that actually innervate each area are tonotopic. And so what that means is that the the nerves in each area are going to have uh, going to stimulate a slightly different area in the brain and so the brain wherever it hits in the brain is going to determine what frequency is being heard so with that in mind let's talk about a little bit of neural processing and uh, so here we are back at the at, at the um, cochlear canal and within the cochlear canal we have the the organ of corti which is the hair cells and their supporting cells and then we have the nerves that run through. Now the nerves that come from these outer hair cells, only about 10% of the actual uh, sound nerves innervate these and 90% of the nerves that transmit sound innervate the inner hair cells. The outer hair cells, however, have efferent fibers, efferent fibers, meaning that information is coming from the brain into the ear. And that's why sometimes the vestibular cochlear nerve, especially the cochlear portion, isn't considered purely sensory, although for, I think, medical purposes we can say that it is. But the efferent nerves will tell these hair cells to tighten down or loosen up on the tectorial membrane ever so slightly. And by doing that, it can control which uh, which pitch is which, what pitch of sound we can hear better whenever it's quiet and which ones we don't hear at all. And so that's one of the reasons why a mother can hear their crying baby from a long distance away when no one else really hears anything because they teach themselves what, what uh, frequency their, their children uh, usually cry at and what frequency they talk at. And so even from long distances or very quiet uh, sounds, uh, different people, like your best friend, you're going to hear them talking to you even at a low, a low amplitude whenever you don't hear everybody else around you talking. 
So these outer hair cells have a motor function, and that function comes from the superior olivary nuclei, which sends the efferent signals. However, the main function of the superior olivary nuclei is to localize, localize sound horizontally, horizontally, or some sources will say along an azimuth plane. Azimuth plane just means horizontally. So if you look left, you look right, that's what the superior olivary nuclei, that's its main function. The other function is to send efferent pathways back to specific areas of the cochlea to tell it to either tighten down or loosen up on the tectorial membrane. So let's assume we're looking at the brain from the back. We're looking at the brain stem from the back. So here we have the thalamus, and then the thalamus we have the midbrain, uh, then from the midbrain we have the pons, and we have the medulla. Now from the cochlea, we have an, a projection of two different fibers and in going into the, uh, the... It goes into the medulla very close to the pontine medullary junction. And then we have these nuclei, this ventral and this dorsal nuclei. So one's closer to the back and one's closer to the front. From the ventral nuclei, we immediately get fibers sent over to the superior olivary nuclei. So this is the superior olivary nuclei, or sometimes it's called the superior olivary complex. So this ventral nucleus will send uh, fibers to both places. It'll send it to the left and to the right superior olivary complex. Then the dorsal, let me change the color, to black, so the dorsal will send fibers immediately over, it'll skip the superior olivary nucleus and go up to, it'll go up a, into the inferior colliculus. So this is the inferior colliculus and the superior olivary nuclei will also send fibers up on both sides to the inferior colliculus. From here we travel just a, a slightly laterally to and, and superiorly to the medial geniculate nucleus. So the medial geniculate nucleus. But we also have crosstalk between these two fibers. I'm sorry, between the two nuclei. Then it travels up through the thalamus and out to the auditory radiation to the auditory cortex. The auditory cortex of the, of, of the temporal lobe. So let's imagine we have uh, both of our ears. Let's imagine that we're having fibers from both sides. Let's also then imagine that I cut off, I, I, I put my hand over my ear, first of all. I'm only getting, uh, I'm only getting volume from the, the, the uh, so this is my right ear, this is my left ear. I'm only getting volume from the left ear. I, I keep going backwards. I push a pencil through my ear. I know it's graphic, but I push a pencil through my ear and I destroy the cochlea. I'm still getting fibers from my left ear, so I'm only hearing sound from the left side. Let's imagine that instead of doing all of that, I cut the nerve right here. I'm still only getting sound from my left side, so I only hear it out of my left ear. Now let's go in and say we take out the dorsal nuclei, the, the dorsal cochlear nuclei. At this point, I still have some sound coming from my right ear, and I have sound coming from all the sound coming from my left ear. So I've, I've dampened the, some of the hearing sensory from the right ear, but I still hear on the right side. So the further and further I go up the pathway, the more and more of my uh, ipsilateral hearing I preserve because it's, uh, more and more of it is projecting over to the other side. So the more superior you go in the brainstem with a lesion, with a with a, a, a unilateral lesion, the less and less of your hearing you lose uh, if you cut off one of these pathways. So moving up uh, weakens less and less of that sound. Now let's talk about the function of each of these nuclei. So the ventral uh, cochlear nuclei is for volume. The dorsal olivary nuclei is for the, the pitch or frequency. The superior olivary nuclei or superior olivary complex is going to help to lateralize the sound left to right. And remember it's also going to send in efferent fibers to help to uh, uh, increase our hearing of specific pitches and specific voices. Then the inferior, I'm sorry, the inferior colliculus and the medial geniculate nucleus, these two kind of fine-tune 
everything. And so, for example, within the inferior colliculus, there is still some more lateralization of sound. There is still some more differentiating between uh, volume and frequency. Uh, but most of that is done prior to uh, arriving at the inferior colliculus. Just a few other things to note is uh, these crossing fibers, both of these fibers as they cross, these are called the trapezoid body, trapezoid body. And then as these fibers from the superior uh, uh, olivary nucleus and this other uh, ascending tract from the dorsal cochlear nucleus, these fibers together from this point upward are called the lateral, lateral limniscus.